A diagnosis of breast cancer can cause a life-changing ripple effect of impact, affecting those we love the most and those upon whom we lean for comfort and strength in the most challenging of times. My name is Ashling Hurley and I'm the CEO of Breast Cancer Ireland and you're listening to More Than A Lump, a podcast that talks openly and honestly to a selection of guests about their very personal connections to breast cancer, be it through their career choice, their own first-hand experience of the disease or through sharing the experience of close family members. My conversations will centre on how breast cancer has informed their perspective on life, love, family, health, their goals and indeed aspirations. Although each story is utterly unique, the one common thread that runs through each one is that breast cancer is more than a lump. This episode of More Than A Lump is proudly supported by CarePlus Pharmacy. CarePlus is Ireland's leading community pharmacy brand offering expert advice and services for a healthier and happier you. You can find your nearest CarePlus on careplus.ie or follow them on social media for daily health and wellness tips. Anne Ebel was 48 years old when she was diagnosed with breast cancer for the first time in 2003. Anne joins me today along with Carol Mallon, who was diagnosed in 2004, and Marion Egan, who is living with a metastatic diagnosis. Each of my guests here in the studio with me today have dealt with their diagnosis differently. They have each had different side effects and challenges associated with their treatment, but importantly, they have found ways to live their best lives with their families and friends, despite the trauma of what life has thrown at them. Welcome to More Than A Lump, ladies. Thanks, Ashley. Thanks, Ashley. Anne and Carol, uh, we've all become friends over the many years that you've been supporting and fundraising for Breast Cancer Ireland. You've attended loads of events and photo shoots together. Um, You've both danced your socks off in Battle of the Stars, helping to raise thousands of euros. But also, it has to be said, having great fun and some good laughs along the way. Marion, I'm delighted to meet you again recently, having originally met when Breast Cancer Ireland helped the Plurabell paddlers get their first dragon boat back uh, oh, many, many years ago. I'm very aware that all three of you have a very different story to share with our listeners, but I really wanted to devote an episode of More Than A Lump to some practical advice and some proactive and positive things and activities that can be considered to help women along their journey. I also wanted to have an honest discussion on the side effects um, and the activities that can help. I'll kick off with you, Anne. You were diagnosed with stage three breast cancer in 2003. You had a mastectomy, six months of chemotherapy and 36 sessions of radiotherapy. For 10 years, you were cancer free while taking a new drug. But three years after finishing the drug, you began to feel unwell and you were diagnosed with a different subtype of breast cancer in the other breast. Talk to me about when you received that second diagnosis and what practical things you had been doing in those intervening years that may have actually helped you in the second time around. Well, I think the second time around was absolutely shocked. I thought I was uh, thinking back of it now. I think I was more shocked the second time than I was the first time. Mm. And like the first time was like 19 years ago. So yeah. it's a long time ago. So the treatment we used to get then was dreadful. Like I know it, sounds, it wasn't, I shouldn't probably say dreadful, but it was a lot harder. Oh, and it has so changed. Yeah, it's so changed now. It's, yeah. I mean, that's how I can see the difference in all the money going into research and how we have benefited over the last like mm-hmm. 19 years. Because 19 years ago, I know I put on six stone and weight. Now, yeah. what I, because I wasn't with all the, the treatment I was getting, I just literally, I mean, I was waddling around. I just couldn't believe it. So I couldn't really go for walks. And um, I got every side effect going that you could possibly get. Um, uh, and actually what I done then, even though everybody's doing it now, is I took up sea swimming in the foot. Wow. Wow. So that's where I was found every day because I wouldn't have the energy to go out walking or go out to activity. I had to be very careful where I went because of the treatment. So I used to go down every day and I'd stay there for quite a lot of the day and I made loads of friends and we'd go for a little walk and we'd catch up on the news and Mm -hmm. whatever was happening in the world. Mm. That was all discussed then and it was great. Yeah, and then 19 years later, a completely different type of breast cancer in the other breast. Completely different. And because I had been on um, a a drug for 10 years from Bowman Hospital under First Arnie Hill, um, and my 10 years was up and I was over the moon when those 10 years were up because I thought, yes, because I suppose in a sense, I probably had put on a little bit of, I mean, I blamed the tablets. I don't know whether the tablets could have been me, but I blamed the tablets on putting on the weight. But I do know when I finished the tablets, I happened to lose weight, quite a lot of it. And I was pure delight with life. 
And I thought, well, this has cured me completely. Oh. I just feel on top of the world. And in that time, you had taken up doing all this the Battle, dance, of, the stars, the Battle yeah. of the Stars and you name it. And I was there. And I have to say, it was fantastic. I mean, that helped people so much. And I don't think people realise how much uh, support it gives to people that are going through treatment or have been mm -hmm. or it's sort of a bit of normality back in life again mm -hmm. and that you can take part in something that other people that has nothing wrong with them are sure. doing. Sure. So I found that I just felt it was fantastic, made loads of friends like Carol. I've only met Marine today, but, you know, um, I just felt it was fantastic. It meant people, the fun that we had and all the people that we met. Mm -hmm. And of course, my fine thing is, you know, Prof Hill. Um, I still was going to him for my annual checkups and it was coming around a time. I think we had not long after coffee day because yeah. I know we were coming around to um, it, I was doing a manogram and one yeah. of the girls, I always remember she brought me a, a mug with uh, you were born with glitter in your bones or, or your veins or something. Yeah. And I was in washing it and it splashed on me. Uh -huh. And I don't know what made me think, uh oh, that's something quite different. I haven't felt that in donkey's years. Right. And I knew I was due my venogram. So I thought I'll wait. I had actually been in with Prof Hill giving a check in uh -huh. and we were getting photos. And I was going to say to him that day and then I went, ah, oh, no, sure, I'm in two weeks. Not thinking, no, you know, it's nothing. It's just some, I wait for my two weeks. And I went in and it was a lovely girl, Siobhan. I think I had it for three years before that. And she said to me, and how are you? And I went, oh, I don't know. There's something I said, it could be nothing. And I remember I was going off Sorrento on my holidays. And she said, oh, I, you know, if you get a note now, don't panic or anything. Just because you've told me something, you know, you're going mm -hmm. to be probably called in. I said, go on. I went off from my holiday Sorrento. In the back of my mind, I also remember going from Sorrento to Amalfi Coast. And I went, I think you might have cancer. And don't ask me why I thought that. Yeah. Came back and I got brought in. And Deirdre Duke, Dr. Joe Duke, she, someone said, here, they're going to do a biopsy. Oh, I said, this is it. And I actually did say it to, to Arnie Hill. Um, I think, and he went, oh, no, and I don't, I don't think he believed it. Yeah. So when he had to actually tell me, I think God helped. I felt more sorry for him than I did myself, yeah. even though I was shocked. I think I was numb because mm. I thought, how could I have it? And there was no lump. Yeah. There was no uncomfortableness. Like there was nothing, absolute nothing. There was no tiredness. Like where before that, I mean, I've always said this, your body is trying to tell you there's something wrong. Mm -hmm. But only for I got a splash, something so simple. There mm. was no lump, there was no rash, there was nothing. Wow. So that's how... Um, and the treatment plan that you were on the second time around? Oh, so much. No, it's still not pleasant, but a hell of a lot shorter. And mm -hmm. it was, I was not anyway as sick as mm -hmm. what I had been. So I could see the benefit of 19 years ago against in the last six years. Yeah. So six years ago, when I got the second one, which was a completely different cancer, mm -hmm. not, you know, but the first cancer was a tumor. This one was lobular. Yeah. So there was no signs. And apparently I think that's the most dangerous of them because mm -hmm. you don't get any lumps and you don't get mm -hmm. any, you know, of the norm of what you're looking for. Absolutely. As I yeah. said, it was something yeah. as simple as hot water splashing. Yeah. Yeah. Unbelievable. And moving to you, Carol, you were 50, you were in your 50s when you were diagnosed. I remember you telling me that your enduring memory was being wheeled into an operating th theatre and worrying that you'd never wake up from the operation to see your husband and six children again. Can you share some of the practical advice you would give to someone in their midlife who's about to face into that kind of course of treatment? Yes, yes. Well, I think at that stage, uh, I was full of fear. Mm -hmm. And uh, the fear had overtaken my thoughts and everything, really. And also a uh, fear, really, not myself and my illness. It was fear of uh, frightening everybody around me, especially our kids. And uh, because at that stage, you know, so many years ago, there wasn't enough explanation of what is really cancer is all about. It was the big C and everybody you know, thought, oh, it's a finale, but far from it, really. Mm -hmm. And I remember being so excited when I came out of a theatre and just saw all of my family around yeah. there again to greet me and say, Mom, it's so lovely that you're here with us. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a lovely moment. I know mm -hmm. it shouldn't be a lovely moment, but um, I think it w that brought yeah. me joy that I got over that big, yeah, the, big event. The terror which that was the, that, the terror of it, yeah. really. And mm -hmm. were you breast aware? Like, were you going for regular mammograms? Were you, you know, I suppose, conscious of how to self-check or was this just out of the blue? 
out of the blue, not a thing I hadn't a clue really. I think I, I'm one of these people I don't go really looking for trouble. And in a way it's a type, the avoidance ain't great either, but that's the way I followed it all yeah. the way through. Just yeah. wait until, and, no, and I know it's not fair to say wait until really the crucial moment, but I, I was not uh, aware. And so you didn't check, you didn't find it yourself. It was probably through a mammogram. Mammogram. I always had, you know, slightly lumpy breasts, really. And I had this lump on my breast for many, many years. Oh, good few years. And I went for a hysterectomy and I was checked at that time and there was nothing sinister about mm. the, the, the lump, really. Mm. And then when I went uh, for a mammogram, this lump became a bit they were curious about it yeah. and sent me I, then i went to a surgeon and he diagnosed it as malignant now after the needle biopsy yeah. initially but i had this lump for many years but it was actually hidden okay. to a certain extent okay and so probably with age maybe it became more prominent but i never thought that it was malignant but it was mm -hmm. and what was your your treatment was uh, radiation therapy Yes. Yeah. And obviously hormone therapy, drug therapy for a couple of years after that. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing, as you say, and as, as Anne has said, years ago, like years ago, back in the early 2000s, yeah. the treatment was very different to what yes. the treatment is today. Yes. And we know that through research, we know the advances we're making with new clinical Correct. trial drugs and that that life and everybody's treatment before you possibly all got the same type yeah. of treatment. Mm -hmm. Whereas nowadays we know yeah. it's all personalized medicine. Yeah. It's personalized treatment plans for very specific genetic profiling, which mm -hmm. is key. And I suppose to you, Marion, you were initially diagnosed nine years ago with early stage breast cancer. Can you tell us a little bit about your story? Yeah, so I was, to give my age away now, I was 41 when I was diagnosed. I had no family history. Um, I had a, a pain in my breast, actually, which is usually, we're told, a good sign. And I thought, in all honesty, it was just where maybe an underwire bra was rubbing or something like that. And it was I was just aware of it for a few days and I kind of had a little feel, but there was a distinct lump. Now, I did not check my breasts because, in all honesty, I thought, and I think a lot of us think, these things happen to other people. It's not, it's not going to happen to me. Mm. This all happens to other people and I'm in my little bubble and I'm going to be grand. And maybe it happens to older women. So, so yeah, I, I was kind of aware of the pain. I had a little feel of it and it was a distinct lump. So I kind of put my head in the sand for about a week, but no longer. And I, I kind of knew, I kind of knew it wasn't right. So I went to my, my GP and she was very quick. She just said she had a very low threshold for referring. I went during my lunch break in work. And by the time I had got back to my desk in work, I had a call from the consultant's office to, to for an appointment. And I knew at that stage she was concerned and then I went in and the consultant did an exam and he said he wasn't sure but they'd send me for assessment and I went then for an assessment the a couple of days later I had a, a mammogram and they said if they saw anything they might do an ultrasound and or biopsy and I had all of it and I I knew I knew immediately and they said well you know will you my husband was there and I came out to him and I said I think there's something and I think they think there's something. So I think it was really clear to me early on. So long story short, I was diagnosed with stage two hormone positive breast cancer. So I had I had to have a number of surgeries. They thought initially I'd get away with lumpectomy, but I didn't. Uh, they thought it wasn't in my nodes, but it was in my lymph nodes. So I had a full clearance as well. And uh, then I had to have a mastectomy as well. So I had three surgeries at that stage after never having a surgery in my life. My biggest fear actually when I was diagnosed was that I'd have to have surgery like Carol. Yeah. That was what I was fearful of. It wasn't like cancer. It was this was terrifying to me. Yeah. That sounds silly now with kind mm. of all these years later, but mm. it was a terrifying thing for me. And I had three kids and, and how to tell them. And they were my eldest was a 15 year old boy. It was difficult for him with his mom having mm. breast cancer. And then I had I'd, an uh, 11 year old girl who, you know, had said to me, well, her friend, her auntie had found a lump and it was cancer and she died. And was that going to happen to me? And was it genetic, even though she was only 11, she was concerned. And so all of those. And then my nine year old and he was trying to mind his mammy and really difficult. My husband trying to keep everything together. 
But anyway, we went through it all, had the surgery, had chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and then I started on hormone therapy. Had some issues around the hormone therapy. Excuse me, had some issues around the hormone therapy. And then I had to have a hysterectomy. And Can I ask you why the hysterectomy? Just because they were concerned? No, they, no, I was having um, really, really heavy bleeding um, oh, okay. on tamoxifen. It was, oh, okay. it was a rare... Thing. I wouldn't want to, anybody to be concerned. I was just a bit unlucky. So we had a bit of investigation and I needed a, a hysterectomy that was recommended and that's what I had. And I went to my consult, my oncologist at that stage, uh, a couple of months after the hysterectomy. And I just said to her, you know, I'm just not feeling like I'm bouncing back like I thought I would. I remember one of the nurses in the hospital saying to me, it's the best thing ever. You won't know yourself, you'll be flying. And I didn't, I wasn't flying. Mm -hmm. And I went to my oncologist and I said, you know, feel free to give me a kick up the backside here. I just don't feel. She said, I will not give you a kick up the backside. You know what? I was about four years out from the initial diagnosis. She said, you know what? We'll just do a CT scan. It's probably hormonal, but we'll just check. And then, um, so I had a CT scan and that was in 2017. And they found what they thought, hoped was a cyst on my liver. And it turned out not to be a cyst on my liver. It was a tumor and it was breast cancer that had spread. So I was hugely unlucky, but I was also incredibly lucky because it was one spot and it was operable. So I had a liver resection Okay. and then I had to do it all again. So I had chemotherapy again, but I knew, you know, second time round, um, I think, you know, at least, you know, the mountain is in front of you, but you'll know you'll get there. Um, I was able to cold cap that time. I didn't lose my hair. That was easier for the kids because for me going to the school, it, it was hard for them. I was really conscious of how hard it was for them the first time around. So did chemotherapy again. And then I started one of these targeted therapy treatments that you um, mentioned, Ashling, and, and why I'm so grateful. And I love what Breast Cancer Ireland are about. I started Palbocyclib. Oh, yes. And I was on that for about three years and I've been able to drop that now. And I'm just on um, a hormonal treatment called an Astrazole, okay. um, which is really hard on my joints, but it's a tablet I take every day and I'm keeping well. And I'm so, so thankful for the research that has me sitting here. You would never know. I think any of you would say you would never know to look at me. Absolutely. And and I attribute that to the treatments I've had. But also, you know, I remember my oncologist and my radiation oncologist saying to me, the best things you can do for yourself is keep active and try and keep a healthy weight. Mm -hmm. And I really believe in personal responsibility. Like I want to help myself. I'm not going to be passive about this. So mm -hmm. that's what I've done. And, mm -hmm. and here I am today. Thank God, five years later and doing so well and, and so thankful for yeah, it. Absolutely. And I, you know, I talked to so many different people throughout the course of the podcast and other ways. And really, clinical trials have come on hugely. Mm -hmm. Like there is a, a fantastic drugs now available for metastasis to the liver, to the bones, etc. I suppose the most challenging one is to the brain. And that's one that we are constantly investing in because it requires a significant amount of money. And we're doing a huge international collaboration with the likes of the Ludwig Center in Chicago. And we are making headway, which is great, because I do want to get to a point sooner rather than later that we transform this disease into a treatable long term illness that can be maintained. That's the ultimate end game. I mean, we got a vaccine for COVID, for goodness sake, globally, as we all came together. So why can we not, you know, really come yeah. together and do this for this Very particular true. cancer? Yeah. Um, tell me about the Pleurabelle Paddlers, because yeah. I suppose way back in the early days of Breast Cancer Ireland, I will remember Fiona Lord of Mercy and her coming into me and saying, oh, Ashley, we would just love, we've no money, but could Breast Cancer Ireland support us with the purchase of one of the Dragon Boats, the HSC, I think we're going to do the other one. I remember thinking to myself, what is this about? Yeah. And when she explained the benefit of the rowing action with women who have lymphedema, yeah. post-surgery, you know, a stiffness, et cetera, or, you know, a swelling that to avoid it or to, or to alleviate it. Um, it all became really uh, un relatable, I suppose. Yeah. And I remember saying to the board, look, we have to support these these people. This is a great thing to do in the community. Tell us a little bit about your involvement with them. Yeah, we're so thankful to you for that, actually. Um, so Pleurabelle Paddlers were the first um, Dragon Boat Club in Ireland. It's a, it's a 
breast cancer club it's, it's all breast cancer um survivors um so it started in 2010 and thanks to to bci in part um i learned about it in the hospital actually after having my um, auxiliary clearance and the physio came in and i was petrified of getting this thing called lymphedema oh my god it sounded horrific and you know they had they the nurses as well they, they they were very well intentioned they were trying to educate me i was terrified in all honesty about lifting a shopping bag i was yeah. like what is this thing going to happen to me there's so much fear around the diagnosis you're just i think paralyzed nearly but anyway one of the physios mentioned the pleural paddlers because i was saying what can i do what can i do to help myself that was really what i wanted mm. and they mentioned the breath uh, the pleural paddlers and i thought that sounds terrific fun so when i was through all my treatments and i'd had my reconstruction and everything Everything. I joined the Pluribels in 2016 and in all honesty I am not a very naturally outgoing person so it's really out of my comfort zone to join this big gang of women with all these wonderful personalities and they're loud and they're proud and they're brilliant um, and it was it, it, but there was something there that really kept me coming back and they were so warm and welcoming it was overwhelming for somebody like me but i kept doing it because i knew in my heart of hearts it was really good for me to do it and uh, so i joined in 2016 and i was really getting into the swing of it and then i had the recurrence in 2017 so i had to stop when i was going through chemotherapy again and i have to credit them in all honesty with saving me in 2017 because i was on I was devastated. I was on my hands and knees, both physically, but mentally as well. You know, a, a metastatic diagnosis. I didn't know if I'd see that Christmas I, yeah. or if I saw Christmas. Was that my last Christmas? Mm. And they just, you know, metaphorically, I suppose, embraced me. They supported me, not in a, a real in your face kind of way. They check in anytime um, I'd go down. You'd be welcome for a cup of tea when I wasn't paddling. And then as soon as I'd finished chemotherapy, Again, um, you wait three months and then you can go back paddling. I didn't know what I'd be able to do when I got into that boat that day. And I was able to rebuild myself in all honesty. And, you know, they take you as they find you. Mm. Um, everybody, all ages. Uh, all ages from we have members uh, in their 30s right up into their 70s. There is a place for everyone in that boat. Um, there is some women that are really competitive. I'd be fairly competitive now. I never thought I was. <laughs> um, and then there's some that are they just want to go and paddle around and have a bit of a laugh. That's OK, too. It's whatever. There's something for everyone. And it's just I have to say they have taught me how to live again. They are the most wonderful bunch of ladies. I'm mm. so, so grateful to them. And Carol, you in your, you know, a couple of years ago, I know de definitely before COVID, probably yeah. maybe five or six years ago, you were very involved with Plurabelle too. Yes. And you loved that whole camaraderie Love and support it. of all of these women. Yes. Absolutely amazing. And even the work up before starting, you do the exercise together. There's a togetherness in it. Yeah. And then there's always somebody, if you're new, to help you into it. And imagine, I would often say to people, well, I'm going to row a boat now. And they'd say, you're going to row a boat. How can you do that? Well, it's you just with the help, you just got into it and these big heavy oars and mm. you're pulling back there. You're in the middle of water. There's no there's no a uh, danger of anything and no talk of any sadness mm. it's all go and also and it helps the bingo wings as well you probably don't know what that is you're all too young Carol, I don't think you have any bingo wings now will you stop so it was lovely and uh, it, the support was uh, was fantastic yeah. and the water the whole exercise mm. game was there's something very calming about water yes. I, I find it I, I would say it's healing yeah. I, I think for me it's healing and we're so lucky we're in the Grand Canal dock and mm. it's just there's a bit of life around it it's lovely but a Saturday morning in particular and say last Saturday morning the weather was beautiful and the sun sparkling along the water mm. it's just so peaceful calming I think healing yeah. Yeah, it's heavenly, those ions it? it's oh, heavenly yeah. it's the right. ions yeah. that it's, kind of combat yeah. the whole mm -hmm. you know the city and the smog and the stress yeah. and yeah. all yeah. of that and then you get the water and it's like calms it all down yeah totally yeah, mm. yeah. No, well, I think I mean, that's not why everybody took to the water and jumped before COVID so, yeah. like mm. you know you're, you've been there for a long time before but it's like everybody it's like suddenly come the 44 yeah. couldn't get near the place I know I mean for years we were going having a great time and then you can't get 
when everybody should have been mm-hmm. separated, we were all like, well, you were, going ahead, down. Of, you were ahead of your game well, 20 years I, ago, I, sea I, swimming. But listen, Unlike all the dry robes around at the moment, and I know I'm yeah. laughing now at you, Marie. I have one too. <laughs> I remember, actually, funny enough, when I went down, because the women were saying them, and the men, actually, because oh. we used to have great sing songs of somebody's birthday. The yeah. cake would be brought down and everybody would be saying, and in the wintertime, they used to have brandy and the butter in their tea and yeah. their coffee, I can tell you. Warm it was you up. really party time. Yeah. I was part of the 11 o'clock. They were fantastic people. And raised a lot of money for cancer. Right. They did as well. And But like, it was such, to be, get up, as you're saying, going down there, to get up and know you're going down to see, it was like as if somebody just, it was like being baptized again, getting in and getting out. You were two different people going down and yeah. getting out, you know, it's it's just, I think it's healing to me, whether it's in early in the morning or late at night, if you're on the sea or down near the sea, mm-hmm. it's just like you breathe in. It's heavenly. It's like somebody sending you something. Yeah. And I'm sure, Carl, you were the same when you joined that. Mm-hmm. I did try to join. I don't know what happened. Maybe yeah. somebody somebody didn't answer Can the phone. Can we get you in a boat yet? We will. Oh, well, we I'm will. very fond of cruises. <laughs> no, no, we'll get you in one of those <laughs> dragon boats. <laughs> Love the cruises. <laughs> Mar- but actually, Mary and I, have ve- we're like, aren't we like twins in yeah. our treatment? A lot of similar treatments. Very, yeah. aren't we? we? Yeah. One, of the, things, diagnosed, what, one of the things I have found actually, um, when I was going through the, the, the heavier treatment the second time around, fatigue was a huge issue for me. And actually, and there was days where I really just wanted to go back to bed. And when you, we, we have a, a little app and you sign up and you're committing to go to training and the boat and everything. I said, oh God, I, I just want to go back to bed, but I'll go because I've said I'll go and we need to balance boats and stuff. And you, you just go and then, there's a thing with exercise. It seems counterintuitive when you're tired and you're fatigued, but actually if you can move your body, it really just energizes you. And then you sleep so well the next, you know, mm-hmm. that night. Mm-hmm. So that was a huge thing for me. I noticed when I was going through treatment the second time round, or, you know, all that that, that heavier treatment. Um, when I went, there was days I thought, oh God, I'd just love to be in bed now. But I'd get into the boat. And then when I was coming back in, when we were coming back into dock, it's like, oh, I, I, I'm still tired, but it's a different kind of tired. Yeah. The sea, the sea yeah. makes the sea yeah. breeze or whatever it is yeah. about the sea yeah. makes everybody have a not good night's sleep, I think, yeah. the breeze that's yeah. there. And what were, what were your side effects like, Carol, when you had your initial treatment? Had you any kind of side effects that were not tough? Really, I, I couldn't say I had any, probably a bit of leaking, you know, around my yeah. breast type of thing, which would it uh, was a little bit startling, mm. really. But I, I actually can't say anything mm. because I, I've i sort of, I think I was in another world actually and didn't think of really or didn't realize what was happening to me mm-hmm. as you were saying, Marion. The fear takes over mm-hmm. and I just didn't realize. And also too, maybe I did feel a sense of no, side effects, not of the treatment, but a little bit of loneliness in my head. I went on the journey on my own rather than uh, make other people fearful or kids, yeah. family and everything. And that was a little bit, it was a little bit isolating going yeah. for my treat- treatment because I, I chose to do it alone, yeah. and, but I wouldn't yeah. do it again because then I didn't, the kids didn't know what was happening. Was I going to survive? Was it very severe? Was I suffering? Because I didn't want to you upset. Didn't want to upset. I didn't yeah. upset them. Yeah. And as you'd say, they heard stories and now they were quite adults, but they'd hear of somebody else and they'd hear something on television and they'd be reading the papers. Oh, gosh, that's what my mother has. My God, that yeah. we are going to be in the same situation. Yes, yeah, so you put on the brave face like put most mummies do. Face, and- which in a way wasn't really the proper thing to do for them either, because I kept them in the dark and I was very much in the dark myself. Mm. But the way I looked at, at it, there was light at the end of the tunnel, I did mm. realize that I kept saying there is light at the end of the tunnel. Mm. And, mm. Here and I it's, am. it's amazing. I often speak to people and they would talk about, you know, the fear never really goes away. Mm. You know, no matter mm. if you have it once, twice, mm. you know, I don't it doesn't know. Matter. I have to say, uh, I, and I, I know it sounds, yeah. uh, I don't fear about getting anything now. Well, after getting that the first time and then the mm. second time, mm-hmm. I just don't think anymore. I think, and I think mm. after being through what we've been through, I think it made us all stronger. Would you agree in the sense? I feel I could deal with an awful lot of things more than I would have. I think I would have sailed. I think it was a person that used to sail through life. Life mm-hmm. was for living and enjoying yourself and all that. And I think 
that it just made me stronger. There's lots of other things that has happened. And when you have to do things and really it can be, even though with all your family and friends around, it can be a very lonely place because mm -hmm. as I say to people, it's like without anything be your faith or anything. When you're in the hospital at two o'clock in the morning, there's nobody else there, only you. You have to have that conversation with yourself. Mm -hmm. So I think I just sort of the way I got through both of them was, when I got a start date off, be it drop their guards off to find me, whoever it was, I start on that date and I knew I was going Can to finish I just interrupt you one moment because our listeners won't know who Drop Dead Gorgeous is and the fine thing. <laughs> oh. And while I really don't want to have this aired. You do. I, I don't really. <laughs> Explain to them who Drop Dead Gorgeous oh. and your fine thing are. Okay, Drop Dead Gorgeous is David Fenley. He is an ecologist in Honest Vincent's to goodness. hospital. And he is Drop Dead Gorgeous. But they were shot over there 19 years ago and he's still Drop Dead Gorgeous. And my fine thing is Professor Arnie Hill which you know very well <laughs> and he is definitely improving with life he's younger looking he's getting now i hope he's not he listening was. he is fantastic and you know something those two men and and, and other people have got me through got mm. me to where i am today mm. because i put my trust in them mm. and like it's probably I, our friend and carl knows ev she always says they sort of guard me in the sense because Absolutely. i'm not a person that wants to go in and say What's happening to you? And what are you getting? Are you getting this? And what's mm -hmm. that tablet for? I don't care. If you tell me to say, I'll swallow it. Mm -hmm. and that's it. Yeah. I don't care whether it's what it does yeah, or what it's it does. it's true. They're like the army on your, working and on your behalf. They do. And they, you know, it's like I when I went back to, and like Mariam was saying, I got cancer the third time. When, without, when I went for a checkup, I remember the consultant, the professor that done the, where I got her on the lung, he said to me, you know, it could come back. And, and I'm like looking and thinking, I'm nearly on the floor here. What are you, what are you telling me it's going to come back for? And I ended up going back to drop that gorge just for another check for, for us. And I said it to him and he goes, you are kidding me. He didn't say that to you. So don't mind him. I wouldn't have sent you for an operation if I thought that. And I'm going, you see, that's how I'm guarded. In the yeah, sense. Everybody's There's there no need. I don't think you. that, yeah, I, I'm just one of those people. I don't need to know everything. I just I need to know basis. Yeah. So as you tell me something, and if I trust you, and I think that's where the most important thing, would you agree that you put your trust in your consultants or your... Um, yeah. How, what do you think, Marianne? I, I absolutely, I, I only see my oncologist now and I absolutely trust her, yeah. uh, uh, Janice Walsh. Mm. However, I do, and I'm not questioning her judgment or, any, mm. or but I do like to understand why am I on this and not on that? What's this? What's the palbocyclib? What's that going to do? Why am I having chemotherapy? And first before, just for me, for my yeah, head, it's yeah. just, I yeah. need to, to understand. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And once I, once I understand it, then we go. And I'm not questioning her judgment at all, but I do need to know. And I am awful for Googling. Oh, Anybody oh, who says to me, oh, don't no. Google, I just go and Google. <laughs> that's exactly the wrong no, thing to yeah. do. Um, and I think that's just my way. And I, I always have, it's not really great for my anxiety, to be no, honest, no, but yeah. that's what I do. And, um, and I know, you know, there's so many trials and there's so many things. And that reassures me actually, mm -hmm. to know that I'm doing really, really well, God forbid, and we're not even going to go there in case it ever happened again. It won't please God. But I know that there's so much stuff in development and that's, so that's how I handle it. Mm -hmm. And that's, I, and I, I, what I would say is, Everybody has to find their own way of doing it. It's, you know, you do your way, I do mine. They're both right for us. It's oh, whatever yeah. is right oh. for you. And I would never advise somebody what they should and shouldn't do because you, unfortunately you have to find your own way. Yeah, I think. I think so. I yeah, think but that's right. what I'm saying. They yeah. sort of guard me yeah. and I'm happy to let them do it because yeah. I think you've enough to worry about mm. in the day. So mm. there is, an, and that's just a personal thing to me. Yeah. But I think like looking back, as I say, 19 years ago, and I on that trial to work for 10 years, yeah. like that kept that cancer away for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And to me now, looking at younger people being diagnosed, it's not a death sentence anymore. Like I remember like 19 years ago, like it was the big C, nobody said breast cancer, nobody said, it was always the big C and you're going, mm -hmm. what do you mean? It was like, the C. wait till I tell you somebody, the big C. Yeah. What big C? You're whispering about it. You again. know, it's, it's mm -hmm. awful where I think now that people, you know, it's, to me, if if you hear, I it's not a death sentence anymore because it has really evolved so much over the, the oh, it has. nineteen Did years. You? With all the research now, and I and I think and I've said this before, they will eventually get it that it will be like 
um, a diabetic getting mm -hmm. treatment. Mm -hmm. And wouldn't that be wonderful? And you can live to see your children growing up and it's, not it's be even, taken away from you. It's even if we look at this new new clinical trial drug that's uh, that's we're a new clinical trial that we've just started and we're Breast Cancer Ireland is funding it. Um, it's called the Shamrock Trial in the new Beaumont Breast Centre, and it's looking at her two positive subtype breast cancer. And it's looking at recurrence that can happen. And it can happen about 30% to, to people who have had a HER2 diagnosis. But we're looking now at giving these people a fourth generation drug, got a big long name, I'm not going to go there, and an initial chemotherapy for maybe a month, then de-escalating the need for that chemotherapy. And they continue on this drug. And we're, we're, we're predicting that in two to three years, we will have a 100% response rate. So that's like tick box cure for that particular subtype of breast cancer. And I mean, Never did I think I'd get to that point over the last, you know, 10, 15 years in this space of that we will actually have a cure. Now, unfortunately, there are lots of permutations and lots of subtype breast cancers. But at least if we do one and we get a, a positive response rate mm -hmm. from that particular one, we're moving on. We're also supporting triple negative breast cancer, uh, which, again, is um, a challenging one because it tends to happen to lots of younger women. And they tend to at the moment, the research is poor. So we're trying to put a lot of funding into this research because they go through the age old treatment of chemo, surgery and radiation therapy. These are younger women who are of childbearing age. Fertility is affected. They're plunged into early menopause. So we're trying to look at a way and say, can we not come up with a drug that is better where they don't need chemotherapy to damage the organs mm. but where uh, and to kill the, the tumour but we can give them something that's targeted specifically for the tumour and protects everything else so we're doing that with Queen's University in Belfast and as I said the other we're doing is in the whole area of metastatic disease because it's an area that there's lots done in relation to a lot of the major organs but the brain is the one that we find most challenging yeah. so I, that's I'd the one say. that we really want to mm -hmm. I think if we do that then we have all remits covered you know, and we will get to that point where, please God, you know, we, we are we are not seeing any more fatalities. So, Carol, I know that there was one particular um, exercise that you uh, took on took on board as part of your, I suppose, recovery and coming through the other side. Do you want to talk to us a little bit about that? Yes, uh, that was a wonderful experience. Uh, the dancing. It was uh, amazing. The stars. Mm. Uh, strictly, mm. strictly dancing. And with the help of Ashling and the girls and Kira and Sam and everybody, it was like a, a, another big adventure in my life that I enjoyed so much. And it was part of the embracing recovery, really. And also uh, when getting quickly to the performance in all the wonderful places that you took us to dance and the rehearsal, the excitement regarding that was amazing. And I remember one in particular, uh, all of them were fantastic, but especially in the convention center. Mm. And I was dancing to a candle, the walls candle on the wind yeah. with Charlie Bird, which That's was a right. very memorable mm. uh, event, really. And uh, Charlie came up to me and he said, you know, I can't put one foot past another. <laughs> and I said, well, here's your friend and I can't either and we danced we were like uh, I said a uh, Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire dancing in the convention center like movie stars mm. in front of a thousand That's people beautiful. and to me that was a, a, a most enjoyable and encouraging event because there were so many people out there who supported us mm. uh, came there because they were ill the family was ill. The, most of them would have been have experience of cancer, and there and Anne was involved in that too. And there we were, like movie stars, up on the stage, no fear, mm. no fear That's right. of anything, and yeah. it was just fantastic. I'll never forget it. And candle in the wind. That's right. And. Uh, what do you, Elton John uh, yeah, playing it for and, Diana, yeah, and right. Princess Diana yeah. the whole memory of that and as a result I did appreciate um, Charlie even dancing with me even though his toes could have been a little bit damaged <laughs> so much so that I climbed Croke Patrick for him oh, this year come nice. climb with Charlie mm. and I was right there at the top with him supporting him because it was payback time yeah. he supported me yeah, and I supported him at 76 years of age. Oh my God, I know I shouldn't <laughs> tell it, but it was published in the Sunday Times. This, uh, that, yeah. this reporter yeah. came behind me and I think he said, who is this old one? You know, <laughs> how's she doing yeah. here? Yeah. So I just in walking with him and right. sliding and him lifting me, I didn't know who he was. I told him my story. I came to support 
Charlie. Yeah, yeah. Um, I can remember all those years ago when Charlie, I had approached him to do the dance with us. Um, and I said, you know, I'm going to partner you with this lovely lady. And he initially, yes, I'll come and do whatever you want me to do. I'd love to help out. And then he went to the rehearsals and it was like, Ashling, I can't dance. This is really not for me. I really feel as if I have two left feet. I'm banging off Carol. I'm banging into the wall. I'm so useless. And I was saying, no, you're not. You're fabulous. And to be fair, he stuck it out. And actually, Claire, his wife, That's she right. really was the backbone, you know, encouraging him to stick with it and that it would be all right on the night. And yeah. it was fantastic. Oh, it was amazing. Mm. I will never forget great, it. Great memory. Most mm. memorable event. And thanks mm. to all of you and Lord mm. CSI and BCI. You were amazing to you helped us. Uh-huh. And Anna, you yeah, took part she, in many a Battle of the Stars. I, <laughs> <laughs> I had such a great time. I really did. Mm-hmm. I just think as Carl is saying, because I think that was the first time. The convention center was twice. And I remember that was film star. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, do you remember we went down with, I was with um, Eric Lawler. Eric Lawler. And he was something else. I mean, Eric Lawler was like, he, I was Tina Turner, wasn't That's I? That's right. He, and Big wheels was, keep on who turning. Was, who was Tina Turner's partner? Oh, what's the comp? Austin Powers. Oh, oh, he dresses yeah, yeah, like yeah, Austin Powers. Like, Austin, Austin Powers. And he had yeah. this purple suit on. And I remember him saying, now, Anne, we were at the door. You know, when the doors That's are open, right. we're waiting yeah. to open. And he goes, just go in, do whatever you want. I'm telling you now. And I was looking, I thought we were to be, you know, walk up nicely and all this. He literally worked that room. The well, window he did. It was in. fantastic. And he just said, he pulled off his jacket. And there he was like with a babe. And t- I couldn't stop laughing on the stage because <laughs> I hadn't seen this. Like I'd seen this purple suit, but this yeah, the babe right. thing. And I thought, oh, my God. And we went down these like limousines down onto the where it was. And that was part of my, my recovery as well. Mm-hmm. And like when Sam rang me that day and said, Anne, we're going down to me. Mm-hmm. And he was, what, me? That's I couldn't. Uh, mm-hmm. But I'll tell you, it was absolutely to me. And we met Carol and we met Ev, we met mm-hmm. yourself, well, everybody. There's been so many people that have come together as a result Fantastic. of those oh. types yeah. of events. Fantastic. You know, it's fantastic. I was at one with uh, the one that Emma Hannigan danced Oh, yes. I was at oh, yes. yeah. yeah. I, I thought you might have been. Tina yeah. Turner. It was brilliant. My gold shimmy you, dress and boots. I still have them. Yeah. Yeah. That was fantastic. Like we we won actually, didn't we? The second did. we got That's we right. got the most entertainment. That's right. Oh, he was. No, I have to tell you, I was on the stage like in stitch. I was like this in shock when I saw him with this big fancy brit. He was brilliant. Mm-hmm. And then 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 yeah, the Carol was talking about was with Adrian Kennedy. Mm-hmm. And like Adrian at that time, they were sort of saying he was the mouth of the south or the east or something. Yeah. And he was just quite sent. Yeah, was so that's quite, right. He was absolutely petrified. Yeah. He, and I'm thinking, how could you be petrified? Yeah, you right, have to all the time. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, I suppose it's it's events like that that people, you know, it's coming outside your comfort zone. And it's doing things like you, Marianne, and Plurabels. Mm. You know, it's something that you would never have thought you'd have got involved in. It's coming outside your comfort zone mm. and knowing that there are people there who'll support you all the way through. Well, Anne and Marianne and Carol, thank you so much for joining me today on our podcast, More Than a Lump. Thank Thank you. Thank you. The information in this podcast is based on the personal stories of those we have chatted to. If you are concerned in any way, please contact your GP immediately or you can contact us at breastcancerireland.com.